Um, I'm going to start by talking about the, the World for All Foundation. Um, tell us a little bit about the work that you do there, what it was set up to achieve. Well, the World for All Foundation really emerges out of the South African context where I became Premier of the Western Cape province in 2004 under the banner of making it a home for all. Now, the Western Cape was the one province that had all the racial fault lines, the religious fault lines, the ethnic fault lines and linguistic fault lines, and whoever wanted to govern it needed to have an inclusive vision, and that was the home for all. When I left government, there was a fascination in the Muslim world, particularly, about how could a Muslim from a minority be elected into governance of a Christian black majority. And so we had to transform the lessons that we learned under apartheid into a vision for a world for all. How do we create an inclusive world? And how can Islam and Muslims reimagine themselves differently? And so that is where the idea of the World for All Foundation came. And so primarily it worked on dealing with the manifestations of extremism in the Muslim world, increasingly the manifestations of Islamophobia against Muslims, but generally dealing with a black condition in the world in which where people who are black are generally marginalized. And so the vision of a World for All Foundation transformed into a foundation and then um, began to get involved in quite a bit of work. Can you explain for us any success stories from the foundation that, 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 that jump out at you? So the one success story that came out was, for example, a colloquium of Muslim minority leaders from across the Western world, particularly, but also from India and Brazil and so forth, in which Muslims find themselves as a minority, but essentially uncomfortable in their own skin and uncomfortable in their new societies who are not very welcoming of them. And so that colloquium um, gathered under the banner, living where we don't make the rules, was about transposing the lessons from a South African Muslim community to other minority communities to say, we need to get a few things right ourselves if we are going to become citizens within the context where we find ourselves now. And so it was, for example, simple things. How to live with multiple identities and not just a Muslim identity. How to distinguish between being, for example, in our case, South African Muslims or being Muslims in South Africa. The one lays down the roots, the other one passes through. How, for example, do we learn to adopt the minimum compliance that our religion requires of us as opposed to demanding the maximum expression in dress, in food, and or, uh, prayer times, and all of those kind of things. So we were teaching those. So that was a major success in shifting, and my years in the USA helped a lot to deal with a Muslim community under siege, but not knowing how to respond. And so that was one. The other one, which was a pretty success, is, for example, the World Fall Foundation was very active amongst many countries in the Middle East that was caught up in the Arab Spring. So it was about constitution writing. It was about living with human rights. It was about embracing freedom. It was about understanding the principle in Islam of consultation and democracy as a form of consultation and trying to teach it. Some learned it, some did not. And unfortunately, some who didn't or were slow to learn it have since had the Arab Springs pushed back and a return to um, military rule. So how would you describe the experience uh, as a Muslim living in South Africa today in 2022? I think South African Muslims would probably view themselves and be viewed by other Muslims, whether in majority or minority contexts, as probably the most free, the most fortunate, and the most rights-endowed Muslim community. My return to South Africa after the USA says something uncomfortable to me, that some Muslims in South Africa have taken the freedom of expression the freedom of association so far that they suppress other freedoms that others may have. So it's taking 
too much advantage of the freedom. So, I, but the principle is that we are of the freest part of a global Muslim community. And that's why we have the responsibility to fast track the learnings of other Muslim communities globally, particularly those in the minorities who struggle with citizenship and those in the majorities who struggle against authoritarianism. But I also think that the South African Muslim community um, must also fight a third battle. The first one was under colonialism, mm -hmm. when Muslims were enslaved and exiled. The second was and the transition from apartheid to democracy, where we asserted ourselves over the constitution-making process. I think we now have the struggle to learn how to live with freedom, how to embrace rights, but to understand that our rights that we have must only be realized in relation to other rights. And so, for example, the right to freedom of speech can't be the right to hate speech and must be realized in relation to the rights of others, meaning that our rights that we want for ourselves cannot be at the expense of another community. Whether you detest what's happening in Palestine, you don't cross the line by becoming anti-Semitic mm -hmm. amongst others. I want to talk now, look a little broader, because the globalization is, is the foundation with which, uh, sorry, we yeah, the foundation with which the foundation is built upon. How would you judge the health of globalization today? Do you see that it is broken in some ways? Is it a positive force? I, know, I appreciate that's a broad question. How would you judge the health of globalization? The World Fall Foundation judges globalization as essentially being a double-edged sword. Every benefit yeah. has a deficit. So, for example, um, what has happened is that we have never had so much wealth in the world, but we also have never had so much poverty and inequality in the world. We have never had so much progress in the world, science and technology, but it has often come at the expense of the traditional anchors that people have had to guide their lives by. And so a vulnerable community like the Muslim one is de-anchored, in a sense, at the when it confronts the evidence of science on many things. So globalization remains a double-edged sword, but it often depends on who has the most power to direct it. And when that power is unilateral and there's no multilateral balance, you have the kind of past 30 years since the Cold War that we have today. It's the most recent manifestation being the Ukraine-Russia standoff. Yeah. Um, but its constant manifestations have been the occupation of Afghanistan, the invasion of Kuwait, the, the occupation of Iraq, the war in Syria, the Arab Spring that was pushed back after Obama called the Arab masses to rise up for democracy. He couldn't um, stop the counter-revolutions when the people did rise up. And so, in a sense, Globalization is essentially a good force. You can't turn back the progress. Yeah. But we've got to manage the deficits thereof. But we also have to guard it against the willfulness of the most powerful amongst us, whether it be a superpower like the USA or whether it be corporations that force their will and consumerism on us. And so, in a sense, the World for All Foundation fights within that context for dignity for people because that is a non-negotiable. It has to fight for economic well-being um, for people. There must be a floor below which no human being should fall in a world that has more resources than it ever has had. And most importantly, it must fight for the equal inclusion of all people in the world. Particularly, it needs action to give a hand up to the historically black and brown communities, the communities of the South, whether they are the African Americans in the USA fighting the cause of Black Lives Matter, whether it is Muslims across Europe fighting against an old-fashioned laicite or secularistic tendency that does not recognize your religion that says to you 
you can leave your dress, your religion, your beliefs, your cuisine at the border and then come into France. And so the World for All Foundation sees itself as an intellectual vanguard against the deficits of globalization. Excellent. I, I want to talk now about um, apartheid, as we referenced earlier. Um, you obviously have a, a, a prominent history uh, in, in, in fighting apartheid. In fact, you were imprisoned for your actions. You were a political detainee. How are we still seeing the effects of apartheid in South Africa today? Apartheid was not simply a set of attitudes of superiority by white supremacists against black colonized. Apartheid was a scientific implementation and institutionalization of racism. And with it the attendant bigotries of, for a while, anti-Semitism, because it was also aligned with Hitler. Islamophobia, because it inherited and perpetuated a system in which Islam and Muslims were enslaved. And misogyny, because it was essentially anti-woman, even if you were Afrikaner and woman. And so we underestimate the degree of rootedness of an entrenched institutionalized racism in South Africa and the methodology of the resolution of the apartheid problem through negotiated settlement meant that apartheid was always going to live beyond its formal death. And therefore, white ownership of the economy remains largely intact. White occupation of the land remains largely intact. White skills in the context of black de-skilling, deliberate de-skilling of blacks would always mean that we would be dependent on white labor and white managerial expertise. And so the point that I'm making is that its persistence would be ensured. But we deliberately took a deposit, a down payment of the political ownership of the land as the precondition for further um, installments of the economic transfer of the land to South Africans. Yeah. And for the first two generations of government, the first under Nelson Mandela, the second under Thabo Mbeki, we were quite on course, prizing white hands off the economy, white hands off the land, and so forth. And then a double whammy hit South Africa. The first one was the global recession of 2007, 2008 that created a global crisis of scarcity. The second one was we elected the worst president that South Africa needed at that time. And it was this president who set about a nine year rapacity, the ability to rape the economy, to corrupt the state and to enrich himself and his cronies, that then meant that firstly, the progress to loosen the hands of the apartheid dead grip on us, particularly our economy, was relaxed. And secondly, trust in the system, trust in the innate goodness of our post-apartheid leaders completely eroded and created an impunity to match the impunity of an incumbent president. And that really is now what has been matched by the triple to the double. The first one being the inheritance of apartheid, the second one being the, um, the, 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 the effect of a corrupt president, and then we were hit by the third one, which was the COVID pandemic, which closed the factories, closed the mines, um, lost lots of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So what we are sitting with now is how do we recover from a health pandemic, a corrupt epidemic, and a 
disease of recession. And that really is the challenge that we face in South Africa today. And so to end that segment, the scorecard on our progress from apartheid into 27 or so years after democracy has not been a very optimistic one. Well, let's, let's close with a look at where the optimism ex exists today. The theme of Doha Forum this year is transforming for a new era. Where do you see the opportunities in South Africa for progress and growth as it emerges from a pandemic and looks to rebuild and reopen and return to some form of normality? Let me speak at the micro and the macro level, because South Africa would be micro and the global situation would be macro. In a very strange way, the rupture caused by COVID-19 immediately followed by the Russian attempted invasion of Ukraine has created what I think in political language would be called an interregnum, a moment of pause and opportunity in the window of history. I believe that this is the moment for the world to reimagine and to remake itself. I believe that the US does not have the popular appetite for war, nor does it have the resources for war after 30 continuous years of war. And so the superpower is tired. Another former superpower, Russia, is feeling terribly vulnerable with its soft underbelly's neighbor to possibly joining NATO. And so it has played a high stakes game, thrown a Hail Mary um, in its invasion in Ukraine. What that tells us is that here is an opportunity for the global south, for the African, Asian and Latin American nations to rethink their role, to usher in not only a new multilateralism, but new alliances that could create that multilateralism um, in the world today, to think through a new security architecture, an architecture that isn't dependent on you have a bomb, I have a bomb, but an architecture that is fundamentally founded on the respect for human life, and to say we will not have that. And an architecture that says, if there are islands of authoritarianism, particularly in the Muslim world, islands of ongoing colonialism, such as in Israel-Palestine, we've got to solve that in order to create a sustainable peace in the world. And more importantly, that peace as the foundation for prosperity and equality, greater economic equality in the world. South Africa will only find its niche in the world if the world reimagines itself in that particular way. Because we cannot be at the hind feeding place of globalization. We've got to find our space at the front end of it as well. Excellent. Mr. Rasool, thank you so much for your time and insight today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Nick.